So Diabetic Foot Incarnation has an immense pleasure in awarding the first Professor Paul Brenda Oration Award to Professor Andrew, Andrew Bolton, who everybody knows is Professor of Medicine at the University of Manchester in the UK. Professor Bolton has over more than 55 50, 50, uh, 550 peer-reviewed manuscripts and over eight book chapters, mainly, mainly on diabetic lower limb and also renal complications. Professor Bolton is a previous editor of diabetic medicine and currently he's the senior associate editor of diabetes care. He was also the founder of and chairman of the Diabetic Food Study Group which it was a very important initiative at that time, in previous chairman of postgraduation education, and then honorary secretary program chair of the European Association for the Study of Diabetes, when we also had the, the pleasure to have a program here in Brazil. He was the chair of the Food Winters Group, American Diabetes Association, until 2007, until late 2015, he was president of the EASD and EAFSD. And from 2050, 2020, he was president of the Worldwide Initiative for Rabbit Education. Also, I had the pleasure to be with him at, at, at that time as well. And he was previously president of International Diabetes Federation until this year, which also something very, very important for all of us. Professor Bolton is presently the chairman of Euradia, European Alliance for Rabbit Research, consultant physician at the Manchester Royal Infirmary and voluntary professor of medicine at the University of Miami. It is indeed a great pleasure and honor for the Default International and for all of us from South America and Central America and many other regions in the world to present, to, to receive Professor Bolton here, to present the first Professor Paul Brand Oration Award 2022 to our honorary member, Professor Andrew James Michael Bolton. It's a very, very important uh, action from the Diabetic Foot International, and we are all very much honored to have you here today, Andrew. Thank you very much, uh, Vijay. Linda, and it's great to see many friends as panelists here today. It's a particular honor and pleasure for me to give this oration because I was very fortunate to have known Paul Brand. And indeed, it's very relevant that, that the chair of president of the Diabetic Foot International actually comes from Chennai or Madras, as it was when I first met Paul Brand back in 1985. And if you don't know Paul Brand, well, whether you know it or not, he's responsible for much of what we do today in diabetic foot care. No. So as you heard from Vijay, he died sadly this day, 19 years ago in 2003, when I was working at the University of Miami. And it was he who described the gift of pain, pain, the gift that nobody wants. And you only realize it's a gift when you lose the gift. Uh, and that's what he described in leprosy. He was a surgeon and a missionary, and he worked in leprosy and diabetes. And he took the foot really from the art of clinical practice and he introduced science to it as well. So as I said, he was born just to the west in the hills, to the west of Madras, now Chennai, in Tamil Nadu. His parents were missionaries uh, working in a small village and he was brought up in rural India. He was then sent for high school education at a boarding school in the UK. Uh, and he trained initially as a builder and a carpenter, and he keeps referring to this in his writing, how this helped him uh, really look at the marvelous anatomy of the hand and foot. He went to medical school at the University College Hospital in London, and in 1937, he met Margaret Berry, who later became his wife, who is an ophthalmologist, and she worked together with him for many years in leprosy, which affects, of course, the colder areas of the skin and the body, so the eyes and the feet were much affected. From 41 to 46, during the Second World War, uh, Brand was a junior doctor in London. And it was there he learned so many of his surgical techniques, trying to rebuild hands and feet of people 
who, who were seriously injured by the bombing uh, during the Blitz in the Second World War. He was a surgical assistant later at the Children's Hospital, the famous hospital of Great Ormond Street. But after his training in surgery, he was invited in 1946 by the renowned nephrologist, Dr. Robert Cochran, who was then working at CMC, Christian Medical Center in Velour, uh, just to the southwest of Madras, uh, in the same state of Tamil Nadu. And he approached the gates of the hospital and to his horror, I remember him telling me this, he saw people just as in biblical days, lying outside the hospital gates with sores on their hands and feet. When asked what, he, what was going on here, he said, there's nothing we can do, said Dr. Cochran. This is just leprosy. It must be a curse from God because people go to bed and the next morning they wake up with new sores on their hands and feet. So it must be a curse. Well, this is what he saw when he arrived in Velour, many tragic uh, signs of people who have leprosy. And he was convinced it was not the infection, but it was the loss of sensation caused by nerve damage that gave rise to the many sad sights he saw. And this it could have been then, but I took this photograph, I think it was about just over 20 years ago, uh, when I asked the ambassador car to stop so I could get a photograph. And this was on the road, what was then Madras down to Belor. And of course, these were barefooted and they were on the oxen cart here, and their foot would be uh, on some area that got a lot of friction, it would cause ulcers. And Brand said to me, I knew it was nothing to do with the infection. So when he said that, he said, right, I'm going to show that I'm wrong. That, sorry, that, that they're wrong. It is sensory loss. So he took a lot of young men and he built a hospital uh, and he put these men to bed. And he said, I'm going to show them that people do not spontaneously get foot ulcers due to infection. To his horror, the next morning, many people woke up with new bleeding ulcers on their feet. So uh, one might say remarkably bright for a surgeon. Uh, he then said, right, I'm going to randomize these people. Half the men will sleep and the other half will watch and see what happens. The clue came in the night when out of a hole in the wall, a rat came out and started touching the feet and then started to eat. So Bran said, right, that proves it. I'll buy a male and a female cat and there were no more ulcers. That's how it was shown that leprosy causes the damage to the feet that you see not because of a curse from God, but because of loss of the gift of pain through nerve damage. And this is from my good friend Abbas, who's uh, uh, with us now uh, as the president-elect. Uh, and we still see in countries such as uh, in Asia and sub-Saharan Africa, patients who with diabetes and neuropathy who go to sleep at night in a hut and wake up the next morning to find and a rat has gnawed away at their foot. Because they've lost the gift of pain, they did not perceive that. So Brand's career was remarkable. He published new surgical techniques for insensitive limbs. One of them still used today for reconstruction of the hand, the Brand procedure, the Brand operation. He became a Hunterian professor of the Royal College of Surgeons, awarded the commander of the British Empire. And in 1966, he, he was invited by the United States Public Health Service to head the Leprosy Center at Carville, Louisiana, which I had the honor of meeting him uh, on several occasions. But as I said to you, I first met him in Madras, December 1985, when I remember going down to Wariapuram, uh, to the center of Vijay's father, and met his father and his brother and his brother-in-law, uh, and gave a lecture there in 1985. Uh, and Brand was a, a major speaker at the conference on insensitivity in the hand and foot uh, caused by leprosy and diabetes. And it was he that said, what I'm seeing in diabetes reminds me of leprosy, loss of the gift of pain. Well, later he retired to Seattle in Washington, the United States, and he was international president of the Leprosy Commission for some years. This is a historic photograph. And Dr. Harkless, my good friend, is on this call, and he'll remember this one. It was one of his meetings, I think it was about 19, the end of the 1980s or early 1990s. This, a lot of well-known people, this is not the composer Wagner, but uh, Dr. William Wagner, who is a professor of surgery at Rancho Los Amigos in Los Angeles, and it's the Wagner classification of the diabetic foot that he first described with Dr. Meggett from Cambridge. This is the late Dr. Roger Pecorero, who tragically died young, and whom the American Diabetes Association named a lecture after him. He described with Gail Ryber the pathways to amputation. Lee Sanders, the first podiatrist to become uh, president of the American Diabetes Association. Marv Levin, the pioneer 
in the 70s and 80s, his textbook of the diabetic foot. The only person who hasn't aged here is Larry Harkless, who just looks the same today. I've just seen him 10 minutes ago. Uh, and here he is on the call. And this is the late Dr. Paul Brand, who was giving a wonderful lecture there. And I went to, he had a prayer meeting in the morning. I went to that and it was the sermon uh, was something you could not possibly fall asleep through. It was riveting. Uh, and by the way, uh, the person on the left is me, which shows the dangers of working in the diabetic foot for too long. <laughs> now, here we have the hospital uh, in Karigiri and beautiful grounds that he was responsible for. They're still there looking after people with hand and foot problems due to leprosy and diabetes. Karigiri, not far from Belor. I remember riding across the railway track. Uh, my first observation is that the level crossing isn't much good because people either climb over or go underneath the gates. And I visited the signal box because I saw that it was built, the frame was built in Manchester. So that was quite entertaining for me and for the signalman who will wonder what I was walking up to the cabin for. This is Carville, the, the wonderful site in his Mississippi River, the leprosy center in the United States that Paul Brand led uh, clinical practice and research for many years. Beautiful buildings and people were looked after well here. And here's Dr. Brand again. This was in 2002 when I was working at the University of Miami and I gave a guest lecture at the American Podiatric Medical Association. And this is the young Dr. David Armstrong who had done his PhD with me and I've never been the same since as he knows. Uh, and here is uh, me looking a bit older 20 years ago. So let's discuss what were the contributions of Brand, uh, first of all to leprosy, but later and mostly to diabetes. Well, he first pioneered offloading the foot. The person with a neuropathic ulcer with leprosy, even before the days of antibiotic widespread availability, he would put, say, these people are walking on their wound. It will never heal. Dressings do not heal wounds. Dressings deceive the doctor and the patient into thinking that by curing the, the dressing the wound, they were curing the foot. Not true. So he said, you need to stop these people putting too much weight on their foot. And he used the total contact cast, pioneered in India and, and then Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, uh, uh, for use in the insensitive foot. I've already mentioned that there's a surgical procedure named after him for reconstruction uh, of the, some tendon damage and bone damage in the hand. But also he said to me, Andrew, I've seen so many armadillos in Southern states and Larry probably sees them in Southern Texas. Uh, in, in Louisiana, uh, in Mississippi, all these southern states. He said, why, I wonder if there's a connection between the armadillo and why we still have cases of leprosy in American citizens here. He said, I think it's something to do with the armadillo because you could actually, in the hind pad, hind paw of an armadillo, you can actually culture the leprosy bacillus. Well, well, it's many years after he died, he was shown to be correct. Here's a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine by Truman and colleagues. Uh, and they said that they, uh, that the research was done in armadillo connection in Carville, but the clue came in 2011 when they saw new cases of leprosy in Louisiana and Texas, and they did a genome se sequencing of the Mycobacterium leprae, the bacillus that causes it, and showed it was identical in those patients getting leprosy in the southern United States to that in the armadillo. So Brand was right. What about his contributions to diabetic foot? Clinical observation, he was remarkable. He said, you don't need expensive equipment to diagnose a diabetic foot. Any patient who's got a plantar ulcer who walks into your clinic without limping must have lost the gift of pain or have neuropathy. I've already told you his famous words here, God's greatest gift to mankind. This is a leprosy patient in Madras quoted by Dr. Brand saying, I will never be free until I get the gift of pain back. Sadly, that does not happen. This is a, uh, we did a case series with Carol Backer uh, of cases of patients who, this patient, a patient of mine who went to his primary care physician uh, and uh, he said, I've got this funny numbness and tingling in my feet. And the primary care physician didn't examine him. He just said, oh, you've got vascular disease and gave him a, a placebo that you might want to call a vasodilator, which of course doesn't work, especially in neuropathy. He never examined the feet, good pulses, pulses, loss of sensation. So after three weeks of this placebo, the patient thought, hmm, I feel no better. I get to try alternative medicine. He went to a Chinese practitioner who was practicing moxibustion, which is like acupuncture. You apply a burning incense stick to the meridia 
uh, and you say when it hurts too much, you withdraw it and it's supposed to help circulation. He had lost the gift of pain, so he had symmetrical burns from the incense stick on his legs. The same year, Carol Bakker in Heimstader described a very similar case that we got together and wrote them up. And he said, the art of medicine is ma most matters. The most important thing to do to diagnose a high-risk foot is to remove the patient's shoes and socks and look at the feet. You can diagnose neuropathy in most cases just looking at the feet. The lack of sweating, the dry skin, the callus, the clawing of the toes, the small muscle wasting, etc. But he also did science, especially uh, in his classic studies in Carville in the relationship between pressure, time, and ulceration to the canine hind limb. Well, he said, the insensitive foot is caused by diabetes and leprosy. So we did the easy thing. We thought, well, we'll do a longitudinal study. Soon after I moved to Manchester, we opened a new diabetes center in 1988, and we screened a lot of patients for neuropathy using vibration perception threshold, and they all had routine education. We followed them for five years. You know the biasity geometry. It's widely used, and I know there's a, uh, one a lookalike made in India that's quite accurate. If you, the higher the, the reading on here from 0 to 50, the more is the sensory loss of large fiber function. And in this study, we show clearly published in Diabetes Care in 1994, that those with definite neuropathy of vibration over 25 had a one in five or 20%, sorry, 5%, 4.95% uh, risk each year of getting an ulcer. Whereas those without neuropathy, the risk was less than 1%. So it's a sevenfold increased risk of getting a first ulcer. We went on with Gail Ryber uh, and Loretta and others, uh, Larry Lavery involved in this, looking <clears throat> at what are the component pathways to diabetic foot ulcers like Pecorero had done the same to amputations. And we showed in a, a large number of cases discussed uh, in a group that neuropathy was the most important component cause, one in four out of five cases in patients with neuropathy, but neuropathy alone doesn't cause an ulcer. It's neuropathy plus something else. And the three in the commonest triad was neuropathy, deformity, and trauma. The commonest trauma in Western countries is footwear, inappropriate. Uh, in many countries in Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, it's barefoot gait or wearing inappropriate uh, shoes, or um, I've seen the kind of chapal sandals used that can cause between the first and the second toe a neuropathic ulceration. So Two out of three cases had this triad. Ischemia in those days was only a person in about a third. Now the neuroischemic ulcer is the commonest we see in Western countries. Here's the pathway to ulceration. Each one alone will not cause an ulcer, or of course, if you walk on a nail, that would, but it would probably hurt. Neuropathy plus deformity plus trauma. The commonest trauma, not the nail, but it's easiest to draw. <clears throat> in a large, study in the community in the northwest of England, Northwest Diabetes Foot Care Study, that we showed in 15,000 patients, uh, and this study was just under 10,000 patients, the first study we published 20 years ago, the Caroline Abbott, three sensory modalities, a simple neuropathy disability score, can you feel a vibrating 128 hertz tuning fork, pinprick, or the difference between hot and cold, plus measure the reflexes. So the score was easy. If the reflex was absent, it was two, and if these were absent, it was one each, so that's five per foot maximum. So 10 was the highest and zero was normal. And we showed in these patients, in those that developed ulcer, the best predictor of an ulcer using simple tests, not even the biasthesiometer, was a neuropathy disability score of six or more. Very simple tests can predict ulcer. Now, hence, Lindsay's words are correct. For one mistake made for not knowing, 10 mistakes are made for not looking, always look at the feet. So that's clinical observation. What about pressure release, relief? Well, Fran did a lot on this. He did early foot pressure measurements. He made major contributions to the importance of footwear, and he even developed an early pressure sensing device to warn of high foot pressures. This was 50, 60 years ago. And here he is in a paper published uh, nearly 60 years ago, 1963. And he had these crude sensors here, transducers. And some of these could be, uh, if the pressure was too high, the patient would carry a, like a doorbell on his back and a wire would go up there and the bell would ring if the pressure was too high. That's 60 years ago. So he was ahead of us even then. 
And we were able to confirm his findings in a series of studies I did as a research fellow in Sheffield in the early 80s and as a consultant moved to Manchester in 1986. The most important was probably the one with Aris Vevis, who was then my fellow, where we showed that high foot pressures predict ulcers in the neuropathic foot. We then worked with a very simple test. Now, in, in India, of course, they used in leprosy the Harris mat, but it was rather, you got rather dirty hands. It was with, with ink everywhere. Uh, and we, what was developed in the Netherlands, and appropriately, that Geen van Schie, who was my PhD student from the Netherlands, did the study here, the pressure study it's now called, a very useful dynamic pressure print map system. It's inexpensive, easy to use, and it can be used as a visual aid to people. Here is the shadow of risk. This is a pressure stat printout. The darker the area, the higher the foot pressure. And you can use this guide to show you how high the pressure is. And you could give this to the patient because patients don't believe there's something wrong. They feel great, the feet are great. But if you say, look, dark is dangerous. You know, when you get dressed or every morning, check your feet and perhaps pin this in the bedroom wall. The darker the area is the ones I should be looking at. And here's what he developed, of course, the total contact cast or the below knee cast, which is still the gold standard for treating neuropathic ulcers. Of course, removable cast walkers are much more popular because you can remove them and they're not as heavy. Uh, and you can use the DH walker here. You can take plugs out uh, and offload particular areas of interest. And David Armstrong, this is one of his studies as part of his PhD with me, he was published in 80, 2001 and worked done with Larry. Uh, Harkus in San Antonio, he showed if you randomize patients, patients to a total contact cast, a removable cast walker, or a half shoe, at every stage there was more significant healing in those in, a remove, in the total contact cast. So in Miami, when I was in there in 2003-04, we did a study where we randomized people to say, why is it this, it must be people don't wear it, because in the laboratory, in the gate laboratory, you can measure in shoe pressures and the pressure reduction is equal in the total contact cast to the removable cast. So we randomized patients to either a regular total contact cast or a DH walker rendered irremovable by putting a bit of scotch cast around the top. And what we showed was there was no difference in the healing times. That's the standard. The total contest cast in Miami, especially made for St. Patrick's Day, because it's in green, to make our Irish ancestors happy. And here is a DH walker, and we just simply put a bit of scotch cast around the top. You don't need a cast technician, even somebody as incompetent as I can put that on. So it can be done easily without too much expense. And here's the Kaplan Meyer plot you can see. Standard total contact cast, the instant total contact cast, which is uh, DH Walker rendered irremovable, they're equally good. So, offloading works. So in summary, we showed that removable cast walkers rendered irremovable are equally efficacious, less expensive, not requiring skilled technicians, less time consuming. They're actually cheaper because you can use the same DH Walker throughout and just one roll of Scotch cast each week. Moving now rapidly forward and, and Paul Brand did in-shoe studies, as I showed you, 60 years ago. Those very crude transducers that rang a bell if those pressure was too high. This is one of our recent studies of my good friend, Professor Neil Reeves, who's uh, working very hard in the Davidic foot and biomechanics of the Davidic foot here in Manchester. And we collaborate and we did this novel plantar pressure sensing smart insoles, reducing foot ulcer incidence in high risk patients. And the premise of this is that we know that foot ulcers plus high foot pressures equal, uh, sorry, the risk of neuropathy plus high foot pressures leads to ulcers. Pressure is a laboratory measure, but can we use pressure feedback? So therefore we aim to investigate the efficacy of pressure sensing smart insoles to reduce ulcers. And here's the insole that was used. This was an old uh, model. It was a bit crude. That's much more up to date now. This study was done about four or five years ago now published in Lancet, Diabetes, Lancet uh, Digital Health. This will feed back to a wristwatch here. This is the wristwatch the patient wore. It didn't tell the time, but if the pressure was too high in a danger area, it would tell you which area that was and it would vibrate. So the patient would say, oh, look, 
the, the area here of my left uh, medial part of the forefoot and patients could either rest or alter their gait and then by feedback could see if they were reducing the pressure at that area. What we showed is this reduced ulcer recurrence by 71%, uh, although the study ulcer rate was low. This is patient empowerment. You've got something that feeds back and helps the patient to uh, alter their management. The last thing that contributed by Brand was the importance of foot skin temperature measurement. He wrote these words in 1975, infrared thermography contributes to the care of the insensate limb. It can detect through heat areas of irritated skin prior to breakdown. If effectively managed, he went on to say, this might prevent breakdown. This is one of his thermograms. This foot's about to break down. It's probably been lying on a surgical ward and the patient with loss of the gift of pain hasn't been turned. But what he showed is before ulceration, the foot heats up. The foot heats up before it breaks down. So we have nerve damage, mechanical stress leading to inflammation, ulceration. If we can identify the foot pre-breakdown, perhaps we can stop ulceration. Uh, Larry Lavery, an NIH-sponsored study, now 15 years ago, remarkable, uh, did this study where he randomized patients in, uh, mainly in rural Texas, mainly Mexican-Americans, uh, Hispanic-Americans, with a history of foot ulcers. They were all at risk of getting new ones. And he randomized them out to standard therapy, which was pretty good. Therapeutic shoes and insoles, foot-specific education, and foot care by podiatry every two months. Not bad. Plus education on basic foot care. The next group was structured examination. They had all that plus. They were very generous. They gave them a mirror so they could expect their feet. And being in Texas, many patients are so large they can't see their own feet. So the mirror was convenient on a long stick. So you could use the stick and have the mirror uh, like you get searched when you're going into hotels in certain countries to see if there's anything underneath the car, the patient could look underneath their own feet. And they were given a log book to record any findings. And they were told anything worrying, contact your podiatrist. The intensive therapy group had all that, plus they were given this temperature monitoring device actually by Xylus from San Antonio, if I remember correctly. Unfortunately, I think they went under but not because of this. And the patients who are self-monitoring their foot temperatures, and that's not Celsius, don't get worried, the foot's not on fire, that's Fahrenheit. It's an American measure. It's actually German, but Americans use it. But Fahrenheit, so that's about 30 degrees Celsius is that. And the patients were instructed to examine their feet twice a day. And if one area, foot, area of the foot was warmer twice, two consecutive times more, by more than two degrees Celsius, they were to rest and see their podiatrist. The results were incredible. The patients who were self-temperature monitoring at an 8% ulcer recurrence rate were in the other two groups, it was 30%. So self-monitoring of skin temperatures could identify the foot before it breaks down. We've moved ahead of that now into smart technology. Uh, and there are smart bath mats, uh, which uh, can measure skin temperatures and feed through the wireless system through Bluetooth or something into the cloud and warn the patient or their provider or both that that foot's actually warmer than the other one. And the first study of this was published five years ago by our friend Bob Freiberg. Uh, and it showed that a temperature differential of 2.2 degrees Celsius predicted almost every ulcer, 97% of ulcers predicted. So surely the foot warms up before it breaks down. And also we have continuous plantar pressure monitoring, as I've shown you, we can use shoes or there are other methods as well. So what Brand started, he was absolutely right in temperature and pressure. We've been involved uh, with, with, in a, with a small company in the USA with a small business innovation research grant where they're developing a lower extremity amputation prevention strategy for people with diabetes. The TempStat is like the smart bath mat. Uh, and originally it just showed you, you could look, this was a mirror, but the modern TempStat uh, has a printer here, a, a camera, and it takes a photograph uh, and it will feed that photograph back through an app to the patient. So the patient can see their own foot by just sitting there. They don't have to stand on this, putting their face on this temp star. Uh, and we know from temperature monitoring devices, from numerous studies, uh, uh, we know that these can be helpful in reducing ulcers. So we could say we shouldn't be telling patients their plans, we should be showing them their own results. 
So in the community, in rural Texas, in rural Tanzania, in rural Tamil Nadu, in rural uh, Brazil, DF, I think, Distrito Federal, if I remember correctly, is near Brasilia. In rural Brazil, people can at home have this technology and they can, as well as their healthcare provider, monitor their own temperatures. And working with Arch Health, uh, we're looking at revolutionizing the comprehensive diabetic foot exam clinical experience using InFocus, which is an app which allows the patients to manage their own foot complications. And InVision is the plantar temperature technology. Now this has a scan, it scans the foot uh, and it will report back to the patient through an app on their phone or to the provider via Bluetooth to the office. You know, Mr. Smith's foot is actually two degrees warmer. We need to get that patient in for a checkup. So we are moving almost into the 22nd century uh, in terms of the last 20 years and modern technology helping us. But these were all the original ideas of the late Dr. Paul Wilson Brand. Now, this is one of my favorite slides given to me by uh, my friend Sharad Pense, who's on this call. Uh, he said the late Dr. Paul Brand in his retirement speech in India said that after retirement, he might become a shoemaker because he said that more diabetic patients have congratulated him on the shoes that he had prescribed than on the foot surgery he had performed. And I'll tell you a story about one of his patients in Tamil Nadu, uh, in Velour. And Brand, this patient had deformed hands and he was begging each day. And Brand did surgery on him, probably the Brand procedure. And he corrected the deformity. And the hands were almost perfect to look at. When he came back, the patient was in tears. He said, Dr. Brand, you've done a great job, but now I beg and nobody gives me any money because I've got no deformity. And that's a sort of sad reflection, but it was true. I remember Brand telling me that. But this is probably the most moving memory of Brand because he was such a modest, humble physician. Because of where I practice medicine, I never made much money. But as I look back over a lifetime of surgery, the host of patient, friends who were once my patients bring me more joy than wealth could ever bring. And he said to me, my patients are my family. So I end, as I started with Dr. Paul Brand, what a remarkable, generous, humble, and talented individual he was. And he's helped all of us, <laughs> wherever we are in the world, uh, in modern diabetes foot care. Thank you, Vijay. Thank you to all my friends. And thank you for the audience for listening. Thank you. <laughs>